Great. Well, um, just uh, I guess I'll start from my background. Um, uh, it's where I came from, and was built into how businesses and things came involved with the schools and businesses fell off from there. Um, I said, my name is Francis Wusu. I was born in Canberra, actually, and so I am a local. And my parents uh, were diplomats from Ghana, and so my parents came from India, uh, posted to Australia, uh, and Canberra being the place where embassies are mainly. Uh, I was born in Canberra. Uh, my grandfather was high commission uh, to Australia. Uh, and so my life, the first few years of uh, my life in Canberra, I was living at the embassy. And then at the uh, age of five, my parents uh, moved to Victoria, um, to a place called Geelong. <laughs> you know, I've uh, lived there, I've been there. Uh, it's uh, quite a, a nice town, not too far from Melbourne. Uh, and I grew up there for 10, 10 almost 11 years. And um, I just, I guess, from a young age, uh, when I went to school, I kind of uh, really kind of had a lot of questions in my mind as to who I was and where I fit in. Um, I remember being as young as, as five in school, um, noticing that I was treated differently a lot of times, not because of what I said, but because I looked different. Um, being um, African, um, and you know, dark African and, and being a town like Geelong back in those days, 25, 30 years ago, um, there wasn't the migration um, of Africans and that wasn't that prevalent in that. Uh, it's if my parents worked at, uh, my mum worked at the Ford factory and uh, it's, it's got that industrial feel to, which is now changing. Um, but, uh, and so I, I grew up in school sort of feeling like I was different and treated differently and because of, um, what I looked like and what I said. And that kind of built a kind of inferiority complex the way I saw my view of the world. And it's amazing what you think about yourself leads you in a certain direction. And, and for me, it was that low self-esteem path. Uh, or maybe I'm not that good. And so that led me actually to a life of crime, early life of crimes, where by the age of 13, um, I had a criminal record. And um, it was going down that sort of path where I would have ended up in jail. Um, and it was at crossroads where my parents um, uh, moved, happened to, my dad got a job, my dad was an accountant, um, and uh, he worked for um, ReadyMix, a, a ReadyMix which moved him to Canberra, and so he was working in Fishwick here um, as an accountant, and he moved back to Canberra. And I remember my parents giving me a booklet to schools in Canberra, and they enrolled me initially in uh, Marist College, and they had the Marist uh, um, you know, annual book, and then the, they happened to pick up a sediment one. And I quickly flipped through, through the books, and I saw in the sediments college um, another black guy there, and I said, I'm going to go there. <laughs> so I'm not the only one. <laughs> and had I not know, I didn't know at the time that the, who I was pointing to was George Gregan. <laughs> um, and uh, so my parents switched me into Sevens College and I started there. Uh, I remember in year nine, I was year nine, and I remember the first few days and weeks walking around a, a big school of 1,300 kids, not knowing a single soul, just moved to Canberra. Mm -hmm. Everyone who's been middle in year nine, so that's kind of where everyone's formed that kind of friendship environment. You're sort of looking in and walking along the, you know, um, the third floor, walking down, walking around by myself. And it took me a while to, to get uh, friends, but when I got a good friend, uh, it changed. We got to start to more settled in. But I still, still felt that sort of inferiority kind of thing that I was still not good enough. I mean, like, the bus was a real uh, experience for me because St. Clair's across the world. Across the world. <laughs> and I was really afraid of girls. Because <laughs> boys, you know, boys say something bad, you can, you can, you can say something back, and you know, girls say something, you just kind of pet them. <laughs> so, uh, uh, catching the bus was an experience. Uh, I used to wait until everyone got on the bus and then I'd go and stand in the front and look at the front and never look back, you know, afraid to people would look at my face or say things. So it's that sort of thing. And it wasn't until year 11 when a teacher who was a former teacher of a Padua um, came to call Mrs. Dina, Doreen Dina, and she came to school and had this radical idea of boys dancing. <laughs> now, if you know anything about Sevens College, it's known for sport, sport, 
<laughs> academics and sport. <laughs> uh, and dancing wasn't something you do, you know, and let alone, um, you know, a bunch of uh, kids decided that dance was something that they wanted to produce. And so they organised, uh, everyone's heard the rockest, they may have heard the rockest mm -hmm. effort. Well, it was a bit the first time that Sydney's College was involved in the rockers effort, and she got 23 brave young guys out of 1,300 kids to venture out to the hall to try and dance for the first time at school. Um, now, I was smart, I didn't put my hand up. But I remember one time, uh, a few weeks in, I was going high and I heard the music in the hall, and I sort of walked in and put my head, head through to see what they were doing, and the teacher grabbed me <laughs> <laughs> and said, yeah, you should, you should join this, you know, there's space for you. So I went, ah, oh, yeah, maybe, and I came back uh, a few times later and I joined. And that became the journey where I got involved in performing arts. It was that point that I remember that things began to change the way I saw myself. Um, we went involved, we got involved in the, we got we made some finals and we came second in the ACT that year and we were the first um, boys' school to do it in ACT and to also to place at home. Um, and that changed me because the first time in my life, I went from being on stage to people looking down at me, to being on stage, people looking up at me and saying that you could do something. I do a move and people would applaud. <laughs> Such a nut move, people would applaud. And it began to change the way I saw myself. And that was the beginning of my whole journey in the era of performing arts. Um, from that point on, I began to, I got involved with a dance group before it was with Dance at the Canberra Cannons. If anyone has been in Canberra long enough, remember we used to have a basketball team uh, that did quite well at times. And, um, we got involved in there. We you know, used to have the, you have the cheer girls that come in at, at half time. Well, we were the cheer blokes. <laughs> uh, we didn't have pom poms, no. <laughs> but uh, we, we wore, <laughs> check we wore the, the baggy jeans and the, you know, the sneakers and the big tops, and we jumped up and we just danced and just go. And they loved us and became a, became kind of a local hit. And I remember at the time, one of the players um, of the Cameron Cannons came up to me. His name was Herb McGeechan. Mm -hmm. And he said, back home in the States, You've seen groups like this, dancing and stuff, and you said to me, have you ever considered singing? But well, we laughed, <laughs> and thought, because we we, this was a group, there was four of us, uh, two of us were from African descent, one of them was uh, uh, Irish, Australian, uh, red hair, and uh, <laughs> the other guy was, uh, was uh, half Japanese and half Scottish. Uh, and so it was kind of eclectic kind of group, you know, <laughs> that we had. And, um, so, lo and behold, we started to sing as well. So we started practicing and we'd sing um, old school Motel Acapellas and started to dance. And not long after, we formed a boy band. I feel like those One Direction kind of things <laughs> today, but we were the early edition of those kind of things. And uh, we started to perform around. And um, it was those years that I really developed my, um, my ability to engage with people. And we used to have this motto that I always give more people more than they expect. And that was when we were, we were talking at the stage. We all, our premise was give the audience more than they expect. And that drove us to, to pursue that passion and excellence to drive ourselves to become better and better. And uh, through that experience, I had the opportunity over, the, over that lasted from, from about a 10 year period. And over that 10 year period, I had the privilege of doing things like uh, television and um, uh, working reporting with, uh, at the time with Australia's. Uh, uh, Australian Idol judge, uh, Marsha Hines, uh, we did a duet um, that we formed a footy show, which is a, which is an interesting story in <laughs> itself, uh, um, because I remember sitting at, at work, because uh, I'll get on to this part too, yeah, sitting at work and I had the best and the worst of, uh, of that, that year, and Fanny Borden goes, and what about Marsha Hines and those dancers? That's a great one, still people out. We did a remake of Eagle Rock, Daddy, Daddy Cool Eagle Rock, and uh, they didn't like it. <laughs> it was a theme song of Manly, the Manning Seagulls, supposed to do that year. Um, so what had happened was that uh, I was dancing and performing by, uh, by night. But during the day, I went on to study and um, get a degree in banking and finance. Uh, and I worked early, my early years in the area of finance. And so during the day, I would be wearing my suit and go to my job at night time. 
I'll be in the clubs dancing and singing. <laughs> uh, or coming back from Sydney, back and forth. Um, but my heart was always wanting to be, my dad was an accountant, so I wanted to go down that, that area, but my heart was always about performing arts, because that's where I got my sense of uh, esteem and my uh, passion for life was from, from, the, from the arts. Uh, and one day, um, my, uh, I went to, uh, I got involved with a, a local uh, youth ministry that, um, that was uh, based in Western Creek at the time. And I started helping out uh, with kids. Um, and that's where my develop of how I could actually use what I had to help others came from. I was sitting in, in Sydney going to watch Beyonce at a concert. These are very inspirational kind of stories. <laughs> <laughs> And I sat at McDonald's and I said to the guys, we're about to go and see Beyonce perform, and I said to them, for some reason, out of the blue, I want my life to be more than just about me. Mm. And at that point on, I began to think about how I could use the things that I gained through the performing arts to help other people. And so this whole notion uh, with me, me participating and volunteering with youth work came together. And I got invited to go to um, one of the kids that I was in my youth group, went to Lang High School, and he said, can you come and talk to my principal? Uh, I think that what you do is fantastic and, and can inspire, be a role model, because um, there, there are a lot of sports role models that come to school, but not other areas like dance and arts. So I went in there and I spoke to the principal and he said, I, I said to the principal, what can I do? What do, what do you need? Uh, and I think with, um, people have asked me many, many years, like, Across, I get uh, emails now from around the nation. Like, how do we get to schools? How do we? How do we? We've got this program, this idea. How do we get into a schools forum? And I think the key, one of the keys, is is to find out what the needs of school are, because schools are very hesitant about people coming in and just kind of do their program. They always think, okay, what's the agenda here? What, but I think position, I naturally talk. I didn't think at that time, but was, well, what are your needs? What do you, what 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 are your requirements? Because schools are, are battling with. You know, the social, more and more social sphere, how to actually engage your, your kids at school, keep maturity, how do I um, get the best performance out of their kids, how do they build a school cult, all these kind of things that the teachers have got to deal with now. And so I, when I identified what the needs were, I then made a program to fit those needs. And I started at Lane High School, uh, the principal there at the time was Michael Hall, um, said come in and I started working in 2002 uh, with a class teaching supporting dance, uh, just supporting them. After a while, people began to ask me, what are you doing in schools, in that school? And they asked me, are you getting paid? I said, no, I'm volunteering. And I, said, and I began to think, well, I can't say I'm a grown man going to schools hanging with kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I began to think, what I'm actually doing? And I, I thought, well, what I want to see is a, a break in the culture of young people that says I can't do anything, I can't be anything. I want to sort of tell, break the barriers down for young people to say, you know what, in this space, you can be anything that you wish to be. You can, you can make it, you can do it, I can. Credit class place. And I began to think, what am I doing? And I think I'm trying to break culture here. Um, and so the name Culture Break was born out of that. Uh, and to kind of mix the whole thing into the very first dance style I was teaching in school was break dance. So culture break, break dance, culture breaking, and all sorts of things. So it was just this, this uh, multi-dimensional, um, dimensional, uh, you know, name. So I went from there, and I thought, how can I? The kids that uh, are being um, engaged in the classroom, how can I give an opportunity outside school? Well, I started to then engage the kids on a Sunday after. Uh, after um, we had a, a, I used to attend also a local church down at uh, Condor or small church there, after the service on Sunday afternoon, I'd say, can I use the hall now? And I'd roll out a break dancing mat mm -hmm. and invite the people in the community to come down. And so we saw about six or seven kids coming down Sunday afternoon after school, or after Sunday afternoon, and just break dancing. Now, I wasn't, I must confess, I wasn't a qualified break dance teacher. <laughs> I learned one or two moves. <laughs> It didn't take long for the kids to realise I was a break dance teacher. <laughs> because we did a lot of rolling around. <laughs> so I thought, hang on, I've got to get someone who can actually do it. So I, I found two young guys who actually could do break dance and said, so can you come help me out? And it began to grow. And friends would come and bring friends to watch and 
uh, this sort of um, culture would start. So I charged kids three bucks to come in uh, on Sunday afternoon to, to dance for two hours and we just go for it. And uh, that began to grow. Uh, and from that point on, um, the whole culture thing was birthed uh, into its next level. There's another was in, was had started its original school, but it's now being formed as a community in the, in, the, in Lanyon. Um, and Lanyon was a very interesting place at the time because it was sort of like Gangala at the time. You know, there was some pockets of Gangala now. There wasn't a lot of infrastructure at the time, so there wasn't a lot of things. It had all these kids, not, not many things to do. There wasn't a youth centre there. Um, there wasn't many things there. So that local hall, the Condo Primary School Hall, was a place that kids could come and hang out. Uh, and that began to expand. Uh, we grew from from that from those beginning from seven kids to now uh, last year in our twelfth uh, our eleventh year seventeen hundred kids a week involved in our programs across the ACT. So it's grown quite quite a bit now. Um, and the whole journey is interesting in stages. Uh, we formed um, our not for profit organisation in two thousand and five. Um, I was approached by a gentleman who said, "Is this a business?" Uh, he came down and checked out what we we're doing and. Was quite surprised to find the kind of kids that were attending. He thought it would be kids in, in like bandanas yeah. and do rags and, and uh, you know, hoods and all this sort of stuff. And you know, he's a he's a businessman and he did he thought he was going to see. But he came, he saw the average kids that you know that live in the suburbs there, and he said, "What can I do to help?" And so he says, "You know, you need to put this into make this into a business." So in 2005, Culture Break was set up as a non-profit charity organisation, um, and began to put some early structures in there to bring a, a, a business stuff and at, at that point we're just a bunch of kids that were just doing a lot of street dance and sort of stuff and really, I didn't have a vision at that point that we're going to do this and, and it's going to become a big business and we're going to do this stuff. I just had this passion that I want to help young people and it still exists today. And, and so from that point on 2005 we began to grow, we began to make more connections in the schools. One school led to another, heard about us and people began to get invitations from different schools to come and start programs. So I thought to myself, okay, how can we now celebrate what's happening? So I thought, let's do a big community concert. So 2000, and this is 2005, but prior to 2004, the year before, I got together with the local dance schools. One was Fresh Funk down in, in, uh, down in Arendelle. And I said, how can we do a community concert? Uh, I had this idea, let's go bring all these people together, we'll have, we'll have you know, a couple hundred people come, and we all can dance groups and we'll just have a good time and celebrate young people in the arts. Well, they said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, they were biting at it real fine, let's, let's go for it together. So I said, let's just do it by myself. So in four weeks, I, I, I started, I, I put together a program, and it was at the Lanyon Light at the Condon Primary School Hall, and I had my girlfriend at the time, and uh, a, a Tabitha Amaji, um, who was, was Tim Maddox's younger sister, and I said, let's put this uh, thing on. Well, we charged people $3, because it's a safe number. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got the kids in the community and the organization, Fresh Fund, and all those guys to come and for the showcase. Well, lo and behold, we got to start, the doors open, and they said to me, the car park, is completely full. And I said, what? We are expecting, with three people, and three people, myself and my girlfriend and Zavita, we expect maybe 100 or so people, or 400 people, or 400 people packed the place. And the people were standing up, the car park was full. And, um, and they got up there and they were just stunned. And I just got up there and said to people, all right, this is my library. Screen, yell, <laughs> clap, let's have fun. And from that point on, the whole Culture Break festivals was birthed. And uh, it started from 400, and we decided to do it again that year, and it went to 900, and it's built on for the last decade now. Uh, we've had international performance from the United States, from Singapore, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand. Uh, it's coming out international, sort of thing. And the great thing about that is that we celebrate uh, young people's achievement on stage, and that shine. Uh, in 2012, we had our 10 year anniversary of, of the festival, uh, and we did a. I thought, how can we uh, make an event that really makes young people feel really, really special? So I had no idea. I'm an ideas kind of person. <laughs> so I went to the AC government, I went to the, the um, theatre, 
uh, camera feeder, and I said to them, I want to do this Hollywood style, ARIA style event for these young people. They said, right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do things like that here. <laughs> uh, so they said, well, go on. So I said, I want to have a red carpet that goes right along the, the front of the feeder, and I want to line up, I want to get all the young people to walk up the red carpet, and I want to get cameras in it, and all the media to come. And as I go, I want them to celebrate their achievements and who they are. They're like, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, be up on hold. Um, it happened. And um, we created this big mammoth uh, thing. And, and I think with myself, like this whole motto, of it, give people more than they expect. Uh, and I think that's a great sort of business philosophy that I try and use is, is to make people happy, you know, mm -hmm. give people more than they expect, you know. Um, it's a way to ensure that you're always pursuing excellence, always being innovative, always um, never getting complacent to where you're at, but you're always pushing yourself to improve. Um, and um, so, yeah, so we did that in 2012, and that was fantastic, and, and that was great. Well, in 2013, as you know, it was our Canvas centenary. So I thought, what can we do? And so I had this idea, let's approach the ACT Centenary Unit. Uh, so I've got another idea. <laughs> I want to do a, an event called um, Dance Nation, uh, which is bringing, I want to have as many young people dancing on stage as possible. And um, they bought into the idea and gave us funding um, to do this. I think we got $25,000, $20,000 funding to do this event. So I approached schools and said, how about we, let's celebrate what makes Canberra, Canberra. You know, we always get the agnar, you know, Canberra's not this, but from a young person's perspective, what makes Canberra, Canberra? What's so good about Canberra? So I approached uh, schools, and we've got 23 schools, primary schools, jumped on board. And we had over 500 kids um, doing So last year at the Royal Theatre, we celebrated an event um, called Dance Nation. And again, it was all about letting kids shine and giving them more than I expect. Um, the, the feeling, if I can talk about the feeling uh, I saw and, and I saw principals, teachers, kids, parents weeping, seeing their kids. Now the kids that we were engaging weren't the kids that were in dance schools. They weren't kids that were, were kids that were left behind. Kids that didn't think they could fit in. On stage, shining like never before. And that changed something in them, it changed something in what is possible, it changed something in their schools. And from that point on, it began to show me more and more that the possibilities of what people uh, can, young people can do are endless. Um, and I've now been more so, as I've pursued culture break, now more focused on the agenda work, of working ways to how we can actually um, find ways to empower the young people to really, really shine. Um, and so last year, I came up with another idea <laughs> um, about bullying. Now, as you know, bullying is becoming a, 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 big, a big thing that's um, sitting at schools and destroying our young people. Uh, with the prevalence of the online content now that's becoming a 24, uh, 365 day assault, on, if I can say bluntly, on young people's well-being uh, and esteem. And, it's something that nobody really knows. I don't have all the answers. No one really knows actually how to actually simply reverse it and stop it. Uh, and there have been great initiatives that are out there doing something, trying to do something about it. But I had this concept that in, in any bullying case, there are usually three main groups of people. There are the victim, the, the bully or the bully group, bullying group, and then there are bystanders. And statistics show that 80% of, of the time, 80 